Uh, hello and welcome to the next edition of District Insights. This week we'll be talking to Julian Issa, the Lead Analyst for Intelligent Home and Vision at Future Source Consulting. Uh, we'll be talking about the current state of the smart home market as well as emerging opportunities for the channel. Uh, Julian, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it would be great. Thanks, Oh, no problem. Uh, it would be great if you could introduce yourself and yeah, just tell us a bit about uh, Future Source. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Julian and I've been working for Future Source for the past year, specializing in intelligent home, as, uh, as you mentioned. Um, yeah, been a been an incredible year to be involved in this space as the global pandemic has just impacted every industry in a way that we were not expecting. Um, but before Future Source, I was involved uh, in a number of different industries, including smart tech, but also industrial tech and biotech. And I spent time working on the ground uh, in across six different continents, really trying to understand what was making a number of these industries tick. So Future Source itself, we're, we're a boutique research and knowledge-based consultancy, um, working across consumer electronics, media and entertainment, ed tech, and a number of different uh, industries and our remit, um, our, our knowledge base stretches from the west coast of the US all the way to the far east. Um, and our offering is, is, is quite widespread, but we do custom consulting projects. Um, we have a subscription service of a number of different reports and product and price tracking. So we have a lot of different services um, and we're always um, at hand to do any sort of research analysis and, and strategy that our clients desire. Um, so yeah, if you could give us a, a sort of quick overview as to what's been happening uh, in the market thus far. Yeah, I think uh, I'm assuming that some people have quite a bit of knowledge on smart home and some won't. It's it's a pretty big industry with a lot of product segments, and it's for the past three to five years been pretty fragmented, but it's slowly becoming more consolidated. So I'm just going to give an overview of what's really going on uh, in the industry, who are the main players. So first of all, you have the home automation custom installers like Crestron uh, Control 4. They've been in the industry for, for some time now, and they've seen their year-on-year -year sales grow uh, pretty incrementally over the last couple of years, although they've been pretty impacted by the global pandemic this year because custom installers have found it more difficult to, to go to people's homes because of the stringent lockdown measures that are currently happening and then you have the supp uh, suppliers and appliance vendors think uh, samsung and bosch and they've increasingly been moving into smart home um, segment as well moving into adjacent product categories but also making their their dumb appliances smart so um, 10 percent of of the appliance industry uh, this year will be smart devices and that will move to 17 percent next year so quite a exponential growth in that segment and then you have the third party service providers, so telecommunications, utilities, um, and they've increasingly been moving into this space. Um, they've already got the, the tight bundling model to do so. Um, and recent examples of this have been uh, Xfinity's home security in the US and then Vodafone's uh, V Home package in Europe. And then finally, um, definitely not least, though, we've got the smart home vendors. Um, they've been definitely the fastest growing segment within the space um, and where we see a lot of the market leaders. So we've got Philips Hue, um, Signify, and they've been dominating the smart lighting market for a number of years now. And then Samsung, Ring, Arlo in August, who lead their uh, respective smart security segments. So now looking a bit deeper into the numbers, um, this DIY product segment, which is uh, led by these smart home vendors, that's growing really fast and is really contributing to the, the fast growing nature of the smart home industry. So this year we were predicting over 170 million smart home devices will be uh, sold across the five categories of security monitoring, lighting, power, climate control, and hubs. And uh, this industry is definitely not slowing down. So expecting compound annual growth rates of 25% between 2020 now and 2024. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And um, what's the kind of regional splits, you know, looking like uh, in, the, in the smart home industry? Yeah, so it's it's really led by the North America, like a, a number of consumer electronics industries. So this year we're expecting uh, over half of sales globally to come from North America, and it's closely followed by China. Uh, and that's really led by the IP security cameras that you have, which are these devices that sell very cheaply. So China has almost a quarter of um, sales um, across the globe um, in terms of smart home sales. And then the third largest market, 
Western Europe, and that's led by the UK, where there's more of an appetite for these smart home devices, usually because um, product launches, especially from the US and China, will, will, um, will happen in the UK before then happening in uh, continental Europe. Okay, and um, how have uh, you know, some of the key segments been performing this year? Uh, key segments, did you say? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So, so any, any kind of, you know, the kind of core uh, categories that we're kind of familiar with, how, how have they been performing? Sure, uh, yeah, d definitely referring to this year as being a bit of an odd year because of yeah. COVID, a bit of an odd year, I think a, a very, very unpre <laughs> unprecedented year. So the categories have fared pretty different, uh, differently because of it, but uh, the, the underlying um, thing to say is that all categories are still performing positively. There's still year-on-year -year growth in each, each one of them. Um, I would say some have performed even better than we expected. For example, smart detectors, so smoke alarms, um, they've seen a big uptick in sales as um, the cons consumers have found themselves in the home for longer, meaning they've been more conscious of a threat of a fire or smoke. And then we've seen any of the, the product segments linked to home improvements also notice an uptick, and that includes lighting. Um, some of the segments that have suffered include security. Uh, I think individuals and consumers have found less of a need to purchase a smart security camera as they're spending more time within the home. And then also climate control um, that we've seen um, expectations not met and that's because a lot of these devices usually need an ins installation team and less installations have happened this year as well. Okay um, and then uh, I mean you touched on it slightly there obviously been an un unusual year thus far. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the impact of COVID have, have there been any other sort of um, trends that you've seen or any other implications? Yeah COVID has had such a uh, such an impact on, on consumer electronics in, in general. Um, for smart home, there have been a number of impacts on, on how consumers uh, are looking at their smart home products. I think one of the key areas that we're expecting within any, any, any sort of device within the home is that the consumer is spending more time with it, um, especially with, with the voice functionality as well. So expecting the consumer to come more acquainted with their, their smart home device. And then looking at the DIY market, we're seeing consumers take that initiative because they're feeling a bit, bit more nervous about a custom installation team coming into their home. So the DIY market has seen an uptick and of course online. So we're seeing a lot of purchases happening online much more than the previous year. And we're probably expecting this year more online sales than next year. Okay. Um, but on the whole, you know, it sounds like, uh, you know, the numbers and the, the prospects have been looking pretty good for, for a lot of the sort of smart categories. Uh, but would you say it's, it's plain sailing now for, for the smart home sector or are there any, any sort of challenges uh, on the horizon? Yeah, it's, it's one of these things when I started to, to, to research and become an analyst within this space, so the first thing anyone said to me was interoperability. That is you know, a perennial issue within the space. And it remains an issue. So the idea that these um, devices need to talk to each other is, is, is huge because a consumer might have three, four, five of these devices and they really need to speak to, together. So we have a number of different standards protocols within the space um, and they have been competing to a certain extent um, to become the dominant uh, protocol. Um, but I, I think that's a, a topic for another time because I think that, that there are a number of issues that or barriers to entry that have been impacting um, vendors in the, in the past couple of years and will continue to, to impact the vendors. So I look more at the, um, the issue for the consumer. I think one, one, of the, one of the big issues for the consumer over the past couple of years has been the price of these devices. So we've um, done a, a lot of consumer research on this area and we've noticed that um, a lot of people still count um, the, the expense of these devices as one of the issues for them entering the space. So 37% of consumers still see these devices being too expensive and that's across Germany, France, the UK and the US. But we do expect this to change in the coming years as these devices become less expensive. So we're expecting the average selling price of these devices to reduce by 10% every year for the coming uh, four, four to five years. Then another big area of concern for the consumers is actually finding a, a compelling use case of these devices. So uh, um, it's, it, it, <laughs> I, I, when, when I look at a lot of these smart home devices, these smart mirrors, these smart kettles, I think, oh, this is really useful. This is, this is pretty cool. Um, then I think a bit deeper, it's like, well, I've been using a kettle 
part one. Um, so I think uh, there are some compelling stories for a lot of these devices. And, and one that really um, stings very true is, is the smart security monitoring device. Making sure that your family is safe, making sure that loved ones uh, are safe, potentially someone who doesn't live with you. Um, that is a compelling use case, but we do see that being an issue for a lot of consumers trying to find that compelling use case for one of these devices. Another issue, a perennial issue within the industry is, is privacy and security. Probably every, every month we hear another, security, uh, another story of a, of a security breach within this space. And that's an issue that hasn't improved over the last couple of years. It still remains uh, an issue within the space. And another barrier to entry has been the knowledge of these devices. So um, consumers, they are not purchasing them because they don't really know what is the use case for a lot of these devices. But we do expect that to improve in the coming years as more consumers buy these devices and then talk to them amongst their friends. Uh, so within these um, sort of consumer you know, based challenges, uh, are there any sort of short term opportunities that a distributor, a retailer or a tech brand should be looking at? Yes, smart home as a service. Uh, we're hearing that the SaaS kind of business model come up in, in so many different industries. You see Netflix and Audible and all these different firms leveraging this, this recurring monthly payment model and it's been working wonders in a number of different industries. Um, and we're starting to see that in this space as well. So the smart security monitoring firms, especially moving away from just simply selling the hardware to a, a smart home as a service model by bolting on a subscription service and getting their consumers to pay as little as $2.99 a month. And this has been most prevalent in uh, smart cameras and smart doorbells. So the most uh, popular device areas in smart security. We've seen companies like Arlo, Amazon Ring, Google Nest, and Canary to target this space by bolting on a range of services, including cloud storage, advanced scene recognition, facial recognition technology, and unlimited video downloads as well through a, a freemium business model. So what I should say is it's free, and then you can pay a tiny bit of money and, and get, those, get a few benefits, and et cetera. And the value for the vendor is, is pretty comprehensive. So you've got consistent revenue, increased engagement with the consumer, as well as greater flow of consumer data. But really important to say, you can't just simply put on this model and, and expect consumers to, to go down that avenue. You have to have value first of all, and there needs to be value in, in, in the bolt-on as well. So you can't just simply say, okay, moving from a free service to charging my uh, consumers a monthly model for exactly the same offering. We've seen firms do this. I'm not going to mention their names and they've really struggled and consumers have moved elsewhere. So there has to be value. There has to be additional value um, for this sort of model to succeed. Okay. Um, anything else within the, the, the sort of short, short term? I think you mentioned, you know, sort of consumer education. Uh, maybe, I don't, I don't know if, if security solutions is, is a thing that uh, the channel should be looking at because I think, as you say, more and more devices becoming smart. Um, is that something that you're, you're seeing or? Yeah, I think referring to security solutions, that, that's an interesting one because we are, seeing a number of different sorts of firms leveraging um, a security package to enter this space. So you see with insurance firms like NEOS, they're an insure tech firm, they've, they've moved into the space by, um, by using uh, a, a sort of same, the same kind of platform that you're seeing with Arlo, Amazon Ring, Google Nest, as I mentioned before, Xfinity, um, which is a telco, they've moved uh, into the smart home space really uh, with, with the home security package being one of their um, primary uh, packages. So we're seeing the security solution becoming an, an increasing gateway into the, in, in, into the space. And actually the con consumer research um, survey, I think it's 26% of um, first time buyers within this space are coming through through well through through with, with, a, with the smart security so it's really seen as as, as the gate, gateway area for this space interesting okay um so short-term view is is pretty clear but i think as you've we've alluded to a few times now um the, the smart home or or you know something becoming smart is just continually sort of evolving so say over, over the next t 10 years there's obviously there's, there's a lot that's going to happen but is there anything kind of i don't know jumping out um that you know that you're seeing that could potentially be something that uh, again retailers distributors the, the the channel should be looking at as as something to uh, to get involved in 
Yeah, a lot, a lot of technological advancements within this space, I have to say. Um, visual platforms, that's going to transform the way we um, see or, or, or visualize our homes as mixed reality and augmented reality become uh, more advanced and then there's improvements within them. Um, one of the the cool ideas of this is that you can start perceiving being in a different environment when you're in your home. We've seen um, Samsung's QLED TVs and the wall concepts kind of move towards that um, sort of area. And then, so, so Future Source, we, we, we put a lot of emphasis around the voice assistant. And we're seeing voice functionality consistently improve. So, moving away from these platforms becoming um, more conversational, less robotic. Um, so it's at the moment it's command and control. You almost bark at this Alexa and it barks back at you. But eventually it's going to become more conversational, more meaningful. And I think consumers are going to use it more and uh, more consumers will want to buy it. So we're going to see voice control improve. We're going to see the visual platforms improve as well. And that's going to come together and create more of an ambient, intelligent user experience where the smart home is it's going to become more immersive, but also more invisible be more natural as mentioned so the QLED TVs the wall concept that's just the start but we're expecting this to emerge across all smart home devices and this kind of ambient intelligent home experience where you don't really notice these devices and they just talk amongst each other that that's going to take some time we initially saw this pattern um, beginning and back in 2005 um, but it's going to take still some time till we get there and then com completely differently completely separately from this is the, the new use cases that we're expecting within the industry. Um, one of those areas is assisted living. Uh, that's been talking about that for quite a while. It's quite a traditional industry at the moment. We expect uh, assisted living to really take off. Um, and that's really linked to security as well, making sure that your, your relatives, um, especially elderly relatives, are, are doing okay and monitoring to make sure that all their needs are being taken care of. And then smart electrical vehicles, this adjacent market, which is growing exponentially, kind of moving towards the smart home and, and interconnecting together. So we expect to see a lot of low-hanging low fruits within this space um, as well moving forward. Brilliant. Uh, well, that's been very interesting. And I think a lot of uh, food for thoughts um, for, for anybody watching. Uh, thank you very much again for your time. Um, we'll share various links at the end of this video um, so if people want more information or they want to get in touch uh, they'll be able to do so uh, Julian thank you again thank you Liam it was a pleasure cheers